Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this SICC webinar. And this webinar is an initiative of the Chamber's Legal Services Interest Group, which is co-chaired by Dawn Tan and by Tony Grundy. Our topic today is conditional fee arrangements for arbitration and international disputes. And we're having a webinar because we've got speakers from the UK and from China, um, uh, because we want to learn what can Singapore pick up from the experiences of the UK and indeed from China. What we have this afternoon will be a panel conversation moderated by Mr. Ramesh Selvaraj, who is a partner with Allen and Gledhill LLP. And in a few moments, I'll invite uh, Ramesh to uh, say a few words and to introduce the panel. After the panel conversation and the dialogue with you, I'll come back just to close up and uh, to thank everyone for their time and for sharing their expertise and experiences with us. Um, since we're at a webinar, um, please use the Q&A function, which you'll find in the Zoom toolbar, uh, most usually at the bottom of your screens, to ask your questions. Ramesh will be uh, monitoring this Q&A box uh, during the webinar and will pose questions to the panel on your behalf. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome uh, Mr. Ramesh Selvaraj, the moderator for today, who will say a few words and introduce the panel. Ramesh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's webinar. Uh, where we are going to be discussing conditional fee uh, arrangements. Uh, as Victor mentioned earlier, uh, we have the privilege of uh, hearing from an esteemed panel of speakers in the legal and arbitration field who will shortly be sharing their insights and experiences on, on this topic, on uh, conditional fee arrangements. Uh, I must say I am excited to hear from our panelists. Uh, they hail from different jurisdictions, and uh, we look forward to engaging in a stimulating discussion, uh, particularly on how Singapore can pave the way forward uh, in this area of conditional fee arrangements or agreements. Without further ado, let me first begin by introducing our panelists for, for today. Uh, first up, we have uh, Patrick. Patrick Robinson, partner at Linglaters London. Uh, a few words about Patrick first. Uh, Patrick has a broad uh, banking and financial markets litigation practice, uh, including derivatives and structured products disputes. Uh, in recent years, uh, Patrick has acted for many leading investment banks in court proceedings, arbitrations, uh, as well as regulatory enforcement actions in relation to uh, complex financial products. Uh, Patrick, I know it is fairly early in the morning in the UK there, so we are all very grateful for you uh, dialing in to participate in this webinar. Uh, Sylvia T is who we have up next. Uh, she is Council Ashes Hong Kong. I should uh, also mention that Sylvia is a former colleague of mine at the firm. Uh, as I mentioned briefly a short while ago, she is presently a counsel uh, at Ashes's uh, internal international uh, arbitration practice, uh, and she splits her time between Hong Kong and Singapore. Sylvia herself is uh, tri-qualified uh, bilingual uh, and is a commercial arbitration and litigation practitioner who has uh, acted in cases involving a variety of uh, sectors and industries with a focus on multi-jurisdictional proceedings in uh, financial services, infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, resources. Uh, next up, we have Gerald, Gerald Kopusami, uh, Senior Legal Counsel at Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, Gerald is Senior Legal Counsel, as I mentioned, Disputes and Government Investigations Legal at Standard Chartered Bank, where he leads the management of uh, assigned major disputes and significant investigations across the group's global network. Uh, Gerald joined the bank uh, back in 2015, and uh, prior to that had practiced as a disputes lawyer, both in New York and in uh, Singapore at a variety of uh, law firms. And finally, we have with us uh, Ruth Stackpole-Moore, 
Ruth is a uh, senior investment manager based in Omni Bridgeway's Singapore office. Uh, she works with other officers internationally to uh, originate, assess, and manage funded cases throughout Asia, uh, including arbitration, uh, and this would be both commercial and investor state, uh, litigation, and uh, insolvency claims. Ruth is uh, herself a cross-border international disputes resolution lawyer, qualified both in Australia as well as in the UK. Uh, she has had more than 15 years of experience in private practice at leading global uh, law firms, uh, as well as at one of the world's leading international arbitration centers. Uh, now, with the introductions out of the way, uh, let us dive into today's uh, discussion. And I think the intention is to, to try and keep today's discussion as fluid as possible. Uh, all attendees and participants, please feel free to key in your questions in uh, the Q&A box, and I will uh, strive to pick them up and, and pose them to our panel uh, accordingly as we, as we move along today's uh, discussion. Now, on today's topic, um, I think all of us will appreciate that cost is often a key factor uh, for almost any party considering whether or not to defend or, or fight a, a claim. Uh, commercial litigants have uh, long sought alternative funding arrangements, such as third-party funding, uh, to manage their own costs and, and risks. Uh, in Singapore, between 2017 and 2019, third-party funding came to be introduced for domestic and international arbitration proceedings and, and certain other prescribed proceedings, uh, particularly to meet this need for alternative uh, funding arrangements. Uh, and as part of Singapore's ongoing efforts to enhance our litigation funding landscape, as well as offerings as a dispute resolution hub, uh, from May 2022, that is May last year, lawyers in Singapore can now also enter into conditional fee arrangements or CFAs uh, in short with clients in selected proceedings. Now, CFAs are an additional option alongside traditional fee arrangements or agreements uh, here in Singapore. Now, you may ask, well, what is a conditional fee agreement to begin with? Um, well, they are mutually agreed arrangements between a client and a lawyer, where a lawyer receives uh, payment of part or all of uh, his legal fees uh, in specified agreed circumstances. Example, if a client's claim is uh, successful, then the lawyer picks up his fees as such. Uh, examples of uh, CFAs that uh, a lawyer and a client or parties may enter into include, as I mentioned earlier, uh, no win, no fee, um, win, more fee, uh, no win, less fee. These, these are the various permutations for uh, CFAs. Um, before we start hearing from our speakers and, and panelists, I, I did just want to, to point out that CFAs are not to be confused with contingency fee uh, arrangements. Uh, contingency fee uh, agreements or arrangements are agreements whereby a lawyer agrees to accept an agreed percentage of the sum or damages recovered by the client in, in the relevant proceedings. The lawyer's fee in itself has therefore no direct correlation to the work done and comes out of the monies that uh, are received or awarded to the client as such. And uh, I think the lawyers amongst us will know uh, that contingency fee agreements continue uh, to be prohibited or outlawed in Singapore as, as things stand. Uh, in the UK, uh, following reform or evolving reform that started way back in 1990, uh, CFAs, as well as contingency fee agreements, as I understand it, are permitted in most legal proceedings uh, with limited exceptions, uh, such as criminal and uh, family proceedings. Now, Patrick, uh, to kick things off, uh, could I perhaps have you share with us from your experience, what are the uh, advantages of using a conditional fee arrangement 
And how might a CFA uh, differ from a uh, traditional billing arrangement that a, a lawyer would have with a client? Thanks so much. Um, as you say, there have been a lot of changes, particularly in the last decade, in fact. Um, and the, the traditional cost model is, is rapidly changing. As you say, um, we, we do still have plenty of cases where it's on an hourly rate or fixed fees for phases of work or for the whole proceedings. But more and more commonly, um, we do see law firms um, participating in the risk of a, a dispute. Um, so basically, the risk of um, losing the proceedings versus a, an enhanced return if, if, the, if the client gets a successful outcome. So um, we do have the conditional fee arrangement that's uh, part of the established um, landscape. And also in recent years, we have a form of the contingency type agreement, which is the damages based agreement, which is effectively um, no fee if, if the claim fails. Um, with you know, wrinkles around the edges around how disbursements such as expert fees and 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 counsel fees are are, are are to be handled. Normally, the client will still be responsible for those. So um, the damages based agreement model in, in particular has become um, more accepted. Uh, it's, it's, we see it slightly more commonly than we used to as people become more comfortable with the risk. Um, we also see these products combined with after the event insurance policies, because in the UK, as I'm sure people know, we have a, a loser pays model. Um, law firms funding the case um, on their own, it, it does happen, but very commonly we see these arrangements put in place alongside third party funding and typically the funders will um, prefer to see um, a law firm acting on a conditional fee arrangement um, because that uh, aligns everybody's interests. So in terms of advantages, it means the law firm can potentially work on different types of claim and different uh, and work with, 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 with different types of clients. Um, and we, we also see funded proceedings uh, with multi parties, uh, actually improving the efficiency of, of, of the way they proceedings unfold, um, can typically be much more collaborative, including amongst co-claimants or, or, or other parties who have similar aligned interests. From the client's perspective, of course, it takes costs off their balance sheet, uh, meaning they can invest elsewhere, or even if they could afford to bring the, the claim in the first place. I mean, obviously, it does mean that the law firm, yeah, having a, a, its own interest in the, in, in the outcome may be more directive in terms of strategy than it might otherwise be, and that's a tension we'll come on to discuss. Um, and obviously, from the law firm's perspective, it does mean a different um, income model, a slightly lumpier, um, uh, if I can use that word, uh, uh, um, cash flow uh, scenario. Now, Patrick, I, I think you, in, um, you mentioned uh, the use of CFAs in uh, multi party actions. Uh, do you find that certain types of disputes are better suited to conditional fee arrangements uh, than others? I mean, from experience. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think the starting point um, to state the obvious is the merits of the case. Um, all parties involved need to be pretty confident of the outcome, um, recognizing um, you won't necessarily have all the evidence in front of you at that early stage, um, but the law firm will be looking at. Um, the, the 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 strength of the legal argument and the factual arguments on the basis of what what is available. Um, the remedy sort is of course a, a, a very important to the availability of this sort of law firm risk participation. Um, it will be yeah, primarily debt or damages claims, or but it may be possible that there are other forms of relief that might um, be sought. And if they're easily monetized, that might allow the, the, the law firm to, to fund that sort of case. Um, yeah. um, obviously, again, another very obvious point, but the, the value um, of, the, of the claim will be a hugely important factor in assessing whether the, the, the law firm will be willing to take some risk. Um, and of course, um, 
with any sort of funding arrangement, there will be a, a big focus on um, the enforcement of any award um, or, or judgment and how any sums may be recovered from the losing party um, and the big focus on security for costs and thinking about um, where the defendant has assets. Um, so all those factors come into the mix where, where, where we, we are uh, looking at funding arrangements and, and obviously you know, looking at the defendant thinking about the risk of its insolvency or asset dissipation, all the things that um, um, you would be worried about, even if you've got a strong case, you need to turn that into cash. Uh, thanks, Patrick. I, I must say, I, I have come across uh, some criticism, uh, in, at least in some sec sectors, uh, as regards conditional fee arrangements. And one of it uh, relates to lawyers front-loading costs, because uh, if you're going to be entering into a, a CFA with a client, uh, typically the lawyer would want to ensure that he's got all the material before him before he makes an assessment on merits. So there's some uh, criticism that there, there is some measure of front-loading of costs, which is then passed on to the client very early on. Um, with that shared, I, I just wanted to uh, to hear from you as to whether you, you've heard similar criticism and, and whether there are uh, some common misconceptions about CFAs that you've come across? Well, I think you've touched on the main one, but I think the way English procedure works these days, there's a real emphasis on, on front loading um, uh, uh, a lot of the, 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 the work in any event. So um, in high court proceedings, we, we yeah, ha have a regime of early disclosure of known adverse documents, et cetera. And so the cards on the table approach to litigation, I think, uh, yeah, is, is generally understood. And um, I don't think having a, a funding arrangement necessarily makes that significantly more onerous. Um, but but it, but it is a point that, that that is made. In terms of other misconceptions, I think the world has evolved very quickly in the UK. It wasn't so long ago that um, that the doctrines of Champerty and maintenance um, were, 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 were mentioned all the time as, as reasons why, from a public policy um, perspective, um, trafficking in litigation, as it was known, um, was discouraged. I think that the world has moved on a lot. Um, people are, are, are have lost distaste to the idea that a third party or a law firm might take an interest in the outcome of a claim when that claim might not otherwise have been brought. It's, it's, it's basically part of the, the landscape. I think there is a, a, a legitimate concern about um, the, the, the role of any funding party, but the, I think we'll come on to talk about this, but the, um, very commonly the, um, the control of the proceedings does remain vested in, in, in the party with the claim. Um, under English law, it's still not easy to assign a court bare cause of action. It, it still sits with the party entitled to the relief, and 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 the, and the parties taking an interest um, in the outcome are very much kept behind the scenes. Thanks, Patrick. Um, on to Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, uh, Hong Kong, uh, we we now know followed uh, in Singapore's footsteps uh, late. Uh, last year with amendments to its arbitration regime, uh, allowing for the use of various outcome-related uh, fee structures in arbitration proceedings. Uh, this was, was very recent. I think it was December 2022, end of last year that I read. Um, PRC law has, uh, as I understand it, for some time already generally permitted all types of conditional and uh, contingency fee uh, agreements. Uh, could I perhaps have you share more in this regard? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> and just just on the topic of um, CFAs in particular, um, I think you know you, you touched upon the fact that Hong Kong has <clears throat> only very recently introduced amendments to its arbitration regime to allow for outcome related fees, and that does, of course, cover um, conditional fee. Um, arrangements. Um, I think the, the key differences between the CFA regime in Hong Kong um, and um, the CFA regime in Singapore is the fact that uh, the success fee 
um, must be expressed as a, ben uh, a percentage of the benchmark fee, which is the fee that would otherwise be charged if there was no CFA um, involved. And there is a cap on the uplift element um, that needs to be um, up 100% uh, of the benchmark fee or less. So it's, it's a fairly generous cap, but uh, a cap nonetheless. Um, there's also uh, slight differences in um, the, um, the, the circumstances in which the uplift fee can be recoverable as party to party costs. Um, in Singapore, um, the legislation makes it clear that the uplift fee is not recoverable. Um, but in Hong Kong, um, there is provision for these fees to be ordered um, by a tribunal if um, the tribunal is satisfied that there are exceptional circumstances justifying the ordering of such costs. Um, that there's also a slight difference in the cooling off period involved in the Singapore legislation. You have uh, five days cooling off period after signing a CFA where the client can essentially uh, rescind um, the, the agreement um, uh, without penalty, whereas um, in Hong Kong is two days longer, seven days. Um, so that, that's, that's just a, a snapshot of the differences, uh, but it is fairly similar as it relates to CFAs. Um, the more interesting um, and significant difference is the fact that um, the Hong Kong legislation allows for contingency fees. So as you had touched upon um, in the introduction, that's the um, an arrangement that allows the lawyer to receive a percentage of the financial benefit obtained by the client in the matter. So it could be a percentage of the damages recoverable, or if you are um, the defend, uh, if you are the respondent rather, I should clarify that all of this um, is confined to um, arbitration and related um, court and mediation proceedings. So in general, we're talking about a claimant in arbitration um, seeking to um, enter into an agreement where they um, pay the lawyer a percentage of the damages um, or a respondent um, for the uh, sort of damages avoided, I guess, um, it's been broadly defined as a financial benefit. Um, and there are two types of um, contingent fee, contingency fees that have been allowed, um, either uh, what is known as a damages-based agreement where um, it's purely, um, like I said, based on um, the the financial benefit that's been obtained and no fees are charged during the course of the arbitration. Um, or it could be a hybrid DBA, um, which is where some fees are charged during the course of the arbitration. So you still have your traditional um, uh, time costs uh, based on the work done, um, dealing with it, that um, issue of you know, there being no connection, but you do have an uplift at the end that relates to the um, damages recovered or financial benefit obtained. Um, so, so that's the that that's um, I think uh, one of the significant differences um, in the PRC. I have to qualify this by saying that I am not um, uh, I'm tri qualified, but not in China. Um, that um, uh, I do act for um, a lot of Chinese clients, so I have a broad understanding. Um, of what is and isn't permitted in terms of uh, provision of legal services in mainland China. Uh, and um, it's just to say that um, PRC law does not prohibit any uh, particular types of conditional contingency fee agreements. And um, it, it, in particular, um, contingency fee agreements are extremely popular in mainland China prior to the changes in the Hong Kong legislation, I had frequently had to um, push back on clients' requests um, for our fees to be structured that way. Um, and now I have no excuse. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think we'll probably cover this um, in, in the later part of the panel. But I, I do think that this is actually a, quite a positive development. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sylvia. Uh, particularly for sharing uh, with us uh, the uh, various, uh, shall we say, various types uh, of outcome-related fee structures that currently exist in in, in Hong Kong, uh, further to the amendments. But 
but there's this thought that that um, occurred to me um, as I was listening to you earlier. Um, all these various outcome-related fee structures, um, and how do they relate or how do they uh, sit with um, a solicitor's obligation to charge fairly for work done? So like, you know, in Singapore, um, solicitors, notwithstanding conditional fee arrangements, there's still an overarching obligation to actually uh, bill fairly for, for work done. Uh, so when you have features like the ability to charge a success fee as part of a conditional fee agreement. Um, how does that sort of, how do you reconcile that with the solicitor's overarching obligation to, to charge fairly for work done? It, it, that's an interesting one because <clears throat> I know that the obligation to charge reasonably for work done is, is um, a concept that has, um, has, has been um, debated in Singapore and it's, it's actually um, a concept that is, has, has traditionally been quite nebulous um, with no sort of fixed um, uh, uh, benchmarks uh, per se um, as to what or what does not amount to overcharging. Uh, there, there have been multiple cases on this issue in the past. Um, the, the, in, in Hong Kong, I guess um, there is a similar obligation on uh, professional obligation on, on lawyers not to overcharge and um, the court similarly uh, do have discretion and oversight in um, disciplinary proceedings um, to determine whether or not um, a, a certain, a certain um, uh, fee arrangement amounts to overcharging and, and that um, the factors that they have traditionally looked at are, are pretty similar and um, uh, they look at the, the um, background of the client and the circumstances of the case, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the, the uplift fee being tied to damages, I would um, assume, um, even though there's been obviously uh, it being very new, not, not any commentary, um, judicial commentary on it, um, that it, it should um, fall within the bracket of, um, you know, the, the circumstances of the case um, as well um, and can be assessed through that rubric. Um, and what is more important is that um, the Hong Kong legislation does impose that cap of 100% of um, the, or, or rather, sorry, I, I should say, in the case of damages-based uh, agreements, the cap is 50% of the financial benefit obtained. So um, there's a cap both on the contingency fee arrangement and a separate cap on any damages-based agreement um, that um, you might enter into. So, so that's um, broadly what the legislature have uh, considered to be um, the absolute ma maximum um, uh, above which um, an arrangement can be cons considered to be unreasonable. But I can imagine that there might be circumstances where um, you fall below that cap, but it's still considered to be unreasonable for some other, um, some other reason. Brilliant. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, let's turn to uh, views from a client perspective. Um, Gerald, as, uh, as an in-house counsel, uh, how do you view conditional fee uh, agreements? And um, if I were to ask you, what might be your concerns or considerations when uh, deciding whether to pursue this as an option? And uh, also, uh, how might this impact your relationship when uh, dealing with external counsel on this. Thanks, thanks Ramesh. Um, before I answer your question, let me preface my response by, by saying that my views are my personal views and not those of the organization that I work for. Um, I think that conditional fee arrangements encourage alignment and incentives between external counsel and the client. Uh, and they also mean that external counsel are putting some money where uh, their mouth is, which encourages confidence. Uh, these are all good for the relationship uh, between external counsel and, and the client. Uh, the biggest consideration is whether the arrangement results in the dispute costing more 
in the event of success than it would have if there was no conditional fee arrangement. Uh, I would assume that we are going to win. Otherwise, I wouldn't want to, to, to be in prolonged proceedings. I would want to try to settle this dispute. Um, and so then the question is, why would the business agree to pay more than they would have if we hadn't entered into a conditional fee uh, agreement? Um, and I think that has been the stumbling block um, in, in wider adoption of conditional free agreements, uh, in, in my experience. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious as to why they've taken off in a big way uh, in, in China. I can see that for certain types of, of case, maybe if you're a liquidator pursuing a case, um, and therefore the insolvent estate doesn't have much resources to fund the litigation, um, a conditional fee arrangement might make sense. But I'm kind of skeptical, other than in the case of, of a client with a, with a sort of working capital cash flow issue, um, what the real benefits of a CFA are. Um, I'm skeptical about the ability to really move it off the balance sheet, again, because if you expect to win this litigation, uh, how do you not account for this success fee as a contingent uh, liability on the part of the client? And uh, so, Job, have you, in the course of your work, actually encountered uh, a CFA or have had to weigh in uh, to, to the business on, on whether or not to enter into one? Yes, I've tried to come up with an arrangement that that both external counsel and the business are happy uh, to enter into, but I've not succeeded in finding a deal that where the economics works. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, Gerald. Uh, let, let's hear from uh, a litigation funder then. Uh, Ruth, uh, Patrick mentioned earlier that uh, it's not uncommon uh, to see CFAs coexist with uh, third party funding. Um, perhaps for the benefit of our attendees and audience, uh, could we have you begin first by explaining the role of a, a litigation funder like Omni Bridgeway uh, in, say, an international arbitration proceeding? Yeah, sure, Amish. Um, so I guess taking the most obvious point, you know, as it says on the tin, litigation funding is a person coming in and funding the litigation. Um, that can be both the fees, the legal fees, as well as the disbursements. So it's a little bit broader than what we're talking about here, where we're just talking about fee arrangements. Um, a funder like Omni Bridgeway might also be involved in several additional respects as well. Um, it can be that, um, Effectively, we can cover um, adverse cost risk as well. So after the event insurance can often be part of the funding package. We can also, depending on the economics of the case, also work in some working capital uh, advances, which can be important for businesses that Gerald mentioned might have an issue with cash flow while the dispute is on foot. Um, so that's what we do. I think the key about the funding that we can provide is that it's non-recourse. Um, and effectively, what that means is that, you know, any return to the funder comes only from success in the proceedings. Um, so obviously, if the case is won, then the return that's been agreed up front with us is payable. But if the case is lost, the risk of loss is fully transferred to us. Um, so that's one of the key sort of elements of the, the nature of the finance um, where we get involved. Thanks, Ruth. So staying with you, um, how do litigation funders then operate in the context of a CFA that a client is either looking to enter into or has already entered into? Uh, and what factors would you consider when deciding which sort of cases to, to fund in, in this context? So, I mean, we're very happy to operate in the context of a CFA. Um, as Gerald mentioned, um, basically what this does is often that the funders and the client's interests are usually very well aligned um, because, you know, 
our return comes in the event of success and success is recovery of funds. Um, so in that sense, most clients, that's their main concern when they're pursuing a, a litigation or an arbitration. So when you then bring the lawyers onto the same page in that respect, it means we're very much all operating with this, the same goals, um, which is very helpful. Um, and as Gerald said, you know, the lawyers are having to put their money where their mouth is. So for us, you know, we, we always, um, when we're doing due diligence into a, a potential investment, you know, we have our own legal expertise with which we analyze the case. But when the lawyers are also putting their money behind, behind the case as well, it gives us that extra confidence that they probably have considered things in potentially a little bit more detail or from a different perspective than they would have if they were operating on an hourly rate basis only. Um, so in that sense, you know, we, we very much like it when, when firms are willing to, to take, um, take risk on a case, be it in a CFA context here in Singapore or in a, you know, in a broader sense where it's allowed in other jurisdictions. Um, but in terms of the practicalities, how it works with us, it doesn't change a great deal. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we pay a range of different parts of the costs of the proceedings. If it is a, a CFA that's been agreed, obviously it just means we are only paying that portion of the fees that are payable at that time, and the remainder will come out of the proceeds. Whereas if we're we're not operating under a CFA, we would pay the full fees going forward. So for us, it's it's you know for those two reasons, it's a it's an appealing prospect um, when firms want to do that. Um, in terms of the factors that we look at when we're deciding whether or not we want to invest in a case or not, um, there's three criteria that we look at, and this is across the board, regardless of whether it's an arbitration or a litigation or whatever the subject matter might be. Um, and the first one is, is the merits of the case, uh, and that's pretty straightforward. We're really just looking for reasonable prospects of success determined on an objective basis. Um, and that's really where, you know, bringing in a CFA aligns everyone's interests um, in that way that I described already. So it's it's very helpful um, on that first criteria that we're looking at. The second thing that we're looking at is economics. And so we're looking at a comparison between what the realistic claim value is and what the funding outlay is going to be. So again, here, a CFA can be really helpful, um, you know, not in all cases, but sometimes we can fund generally up to about 10% of a claim's realistic value. So if you're looking at a full fee arrangement, it may be that we're very close to or even exceeding that 10 to 1 ratio, which means we may not be able to then fund the case. But if the firm is willing to then offer a CFA or, or a different damages-based agreement, um, or damages based agreement or other arrangement in other jurisdictions, it can bring down the amount of funding that's required and then means that the economics might work um, for a case that otherwise it might not. Um, and then the final thing that we're always looking at is the enforceability um, of the judgment or the award. So in terms of front loading that, that we talked about with Patrick, you know, I mean, it always seems unwise when clients pursue a case without really having considered these things in advance anyway. Um, but when we come on, we really do a full review of the counterpart. We make sure, you know, we can't do anything if, if a client is going to be, in, the counterpart is unable to pay. But if, if they're just unwilling to pay, um, then we can get a really good view of where the assets are and what the likely enforcement strategy will be. Um, and so, you know, we look at that very closely before we take any decision to fund. Thanks, Ruth. That was very helpful. Uh, I, I think you talked briefly towards the end about um, enforcing a judgment or an arbitration award, uh, arbitration award and, and, and considerations in that regard. Uh, there's a question in uh, the Q&A box which relates to not the enforceability of a judgment or, or an award, but uh, the enforceability of a conditional fee agreement to begin with. Uh, and the question relates to situations where uh, CFA may be rendered unenforceable. Uh, one of the criticisms I've heard about CFAs is that it may actually spawn satellite litigation uh, regarding the uh, recovery of the success or, or uplift fees. So that, that's something I've heard as, as, as uh, one potential criticism uh, uh, for allowing CFAs. Now, let, let me perhaps throw this out to the, the lawyers uh, on the panel. Um, are there safeguards you think that are in place to mitigate the use or uh, rather the risk of any potential abuse by uh, lawyers of CFAs? Patrick? Sure. I mean, it's, it's actually quite interesting, that observation about um, fights, about recoverability of uplift. Um, a large part of the reforms we had in the UK 10 years ago was to get rid of the prior regime where a success fee was recoverable from the other side. 
um, that that was not um, really working in the market, and we en ended up having a lot of satellite disputes. So, so now we're on a uh, our conditional fee uh, and damages based agreement models. Um, mean that we don't have that, um, that, that that anymore. And I think that's been a very positive development for everybody. Um, in terms of safeguards more generally, um, obviously there's a professional conduct um, obligation to, to inform your um, client of the, the cost risk in litigation. And, and, and there will um, generally be a discussion about um, options for funding and risk participation where that, where, where that may, have, may be of, of um, interest to the client so uh, you have to give an objective view on that and um, you know the law firm ha you know, will be very mindful of its obligations to make sure the client gets the right advice about the options that are available um yeah if you've got a damages based agreement the law firm is effectively acting as a litigation funder um some of the moral hazard there has been um uh, mitigated by the rule which is that the uh, the, the 50% is the maximum you can take of the final damages award. Um, and that's been settled on as a number which doesn't um, doesn't meet lead to, to, to a high risk of abuse. I do remember one uh, case from before this regime where a, 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 a claimant had to disclose to the court that the fundish take was 80% of the returns and, and, and the court was rather aghast about, about that, that sort of conduct. And so um, the, you know, we're, 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 the, the UK rules do try to prevent that. Um, there are uh, discussions about what sort of regulation might be required. At the moment it's largely self-regulated. Uh, um, but we do have an association of litigation funders. There are co codes of conduct which are followed, which which mitigate some of some of some of the the, um, the, the risk here. So th there's there's there are a bundle of protections which um, which 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 mean that law firms um, um, have limited scope to, to to act in a way which might not be in their client's interest, and it's all really focused on that alignment of interests we've discussed. Thanks, Patrick. Sylvia, anything you want to add to or uh, weigh in on? Yeah, sure. I mean, I agree with um, all the points that Patrick has made. And from a Hong Kong uh, perspective, um, I think I, I had touched upon the uplift cap, uh, which is the same as the UK previously for DBAs, and also the cap on the CFA uplift, which is um, 100%. Um, the, there's um, also, um, the that cooling off period that I had uh, alluded to um, earlier on, but in general, just basically the, the professional obligations and the professional regime um, does uh, uh, provide um, uh, pro provide um, strong safeguards um, in in that regard. Um, I think one other thing that is made quite clear in the Hong Kong. Um, regulations, which um, is quite similar um, to the Singapore um, legislation, is um, the importance of explaining to the client um, the details of what the arrangement entails um, mm -hmm. and its potential risks and benefits um, in plain language. So um, the Hong Kong regime um, requires lawyers to provide information relating to the nature of the agreement, uh, the specific conditions applicable, um, as well as um, uh, include as a statement um, to the client that um, the client has the right to seek independent legal advice in relation to the fee agreements. Uh, and all this needs to be set out in um, clear and accessible language prior to entering into the um, CFA DBA or hybrid DBA. Uh, the Singapore regime also has a similar requirement and refers to um, uh, the the, uh, the the requirement of providing this information in plain language. And I, I should say that um, as a firm at Ashes, it is our standard practice globally to um, provide this kind of plain language letter to the client in any event across all of, our, all of the jurisdictions that we operate in where, where these types of arrangements are entered into. Um, and I would be very surprised if this was not standard practice in um, other international firms as well. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, perhaps we can jump back to, to Ruth uh, uh, now. 
Ruth, I think you, you mentioned earlier um, dealing with clients um, who um, are considering uh, or have entered into a CFA with their lawyers as well. So let me just pose this scenario to you, Ruth. You, you're talking to a client, potential client, who is looking to pursue a, a, a claim in an international arbitration setting. Um, so they're obviously talking to you about third party funding uh, and they are also considering the prospect of entering into a CFA with their lawyers. Uh, what might you be able to do uh, to help the potential client uh, make up his mind on whether or not to enter into a CFA to begin with as a, in your role and capacity as a funder? Yeah, so I mean, we don't ever want to stray into advising a client. Um, you know, when that's not our role. Um, so we we will avoid that. Um, you know, cases typically come to us in two ways. Um, either there is already, you know, a law firm involved, and then typically the engagement agreement is likely already settled. So this conversation may have preceded, you know, the conversation with us, in which case, you know, it would be it may be the case um, that if the economics are going to be very tight in the situation I mentioned before, um, that we might suggest to the client, look, you know, as things currently stand on a full fee basis, we're probably not going to be able to fund. But, you know, if the lawyers consider, you know, if you if you want to discuss with them whether they're willing to, to operate, um, you know, under a different type of fee arrangement, um, then that might bring it within, uh, you know, economics that work for us. So we might raise it in that context, but then the discussion would always still be for the client and their firm to, to really understand um, what their options are. The second way that cases come to us can be when clients come to us directly. So, it, and before really they've engaged with lawyers. Um, sometimes part of the service that we can offer is, you know, insights into which firms in a region might have specific expertise in a particular field or subject matter or, you know, various other things given the, the volume and, you know, number of cases that we tend to see. Um, so that does happen. And one of the things they might ask us is, you know, who do you know which firms are currently, in, you know, operating under these different types of fee arrangements, if that's important to them. Um, and so to the extent that we know, we might be able to point them in the direction of, of firms who are willing to do that. Um, and then what we would do in either scenario, if that is, is coming under consideration, is simply explain how that then works in combination with the funding. Um, so effectively, you know, that kind of arrangement is generally advantageous to the client because the less often our, our funding return will be based on what is the higher of either a multiple of what we've spent or a percentage of the recoveries. So if you end up looking at a multiple based return to us, if we've had to spend less on legal fees, then the return on that basis will be less. Um, so we basically just explain the different different outcomes that might result from the amount that we have to spend on the legal fees. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, Gerald, um, as a client, uh, what advice would you have for uh, in-house counsel or, or clients considering using CFAs uh, as part of their uh, dispute resolution strategy? Would you would you have uh, uh, advice or comments or thoughts you, you might want to share? I think that one thing that you have to consider is whether the CFA is legal, not just in the forum where you're having your arbitration or litigation, but also in the places where you might need to enforce the award or judgment. Uh, because once you've obtained an award and judgment and you go somewhere else to enforce it or execute, you can expect any and every sort of objection thrown in your way. And uh, they will argue if they can that this, uh, this award is illegal because uh, your lawyers uh, had entered into a conditional fee agreement with you. Whether there's any merit to that doesn't matter. It's going to be something you have to consider. Um, the other thing that to consider is the is the extent to which the the uplift, the success fee is recoverable. You've heard that in Singapore, it's not going to be recoverable. Um, so you just have to consider that. Although that might not be um, a big factor if uh, your uh, if your opponent isn't wasn't going to be able to satisfy all of the costs in the first place. Um, 
So those are the things which which I think are are worth considering. Thanks, Charles. That, that, that's helpful. Let, let's talk a bit about the impact uh, and effect CFAs uh, have, have had. Uh, Patrick, in your experience in the UK, um, what effect has uh, conditional fee arrangements or agreements had uh, on the ability of companies and businesses to, to prosecute uh, and defend claims in particularly the international dispute space? Well, I think it's had a, a, a big impact. And as I, as I mentioned, and before the reforms started 30 years ago, there was a real concern that um, claimants might not be able to bring good claims simply because they had insufficient funding against well-resourced defendants. And so there was a, a bit of a barrier there in terms of access to ju uh, justice. As I mentioned, we also um, had a, a regime which has now gone in relation uh, where where the success fee could um, be passed on to the losing party. Um, that did um, produce a flurry of cases, but it tended to be sort of smaller value claims where often the, the sums claims actually outweighed you know, were, were, were overshadowed by the, the legal fees and, and disputes about that. So that this other satellite litigation where we talked about earlier was a notable feature of the funding market. But um, responding to the criticism that the funders were not really taking the risk um, in, in the proceedings, we've moved to the current regime. Um, and I think that has um, worked well, actually. Um, it can't be seen in isolation because in the UK we've had reforms on um, class actions, particularly in the competition sphere, and, and a much more willingness on the courts to think about active use of case management powers and, 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 and all, making group litigation orders which allow lots of claims to be brought together. And combined with funding, that's actually meant a much more active market. Um, which allows claims to be brought and, and with the controls we've talked about actually brought in a very responsible way. Um, so I think it's been a very positive development. I think um, the UK as a, as a centre, you know, it does attract quite a lot of litigation and we're seeing lots of um, multi-jurisdictional uh, claims actually uh, being, being brought here. Um, uh, and I think um, some of the reforms that have facilitated that, um, and we, we see lots of um, yeah, parent company parent company liability or sort of mass tort claims finding their way to the UK with funding being one of the reasons they're coming here. So it has actually um, um, yeah, had a very uh, significant impact on, on the UK litigation market. On, on the defence side, very briefly, obviously it does mean potentially um, increase costs of dealing with defend um, with defending claims that might not otherwise um, be be brought, and and dealing with with multiple litigant litigants potentially rather than facing off against individual um, claimants. But I think you know people recognise that you know as long as the claims aren't frivolous, um, that that is the way of the world, and and, and claims need to be prosecuted. So it's it 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 has changed the market in a way that um, is is actually quite noticeable now. Uh, Sylvia, uh, what about in Hong Kong? I, I know the uh, reform has only come about fairly recently, end, end of the year. Uh, but in your observation, um, the reform, uh, are you starting to see um, changes? Are you starting to see a change in the appetite, perhaps, for international dispute resolution amongst uh, potential commercial litigants in, in Hong Kong? Yeah, thanks, Ramesh. Um... I, as you've noted, um, it's it's been um, less than four months really since the law came into force. So the full extent to which this will actually have an impact remains to be seen. But just um, sort of based on um, my my own personal anecdotal experience, um, the early signs indicate that um, what it will potentially do is increase the appetite for uh, potential claimants to pursue. Um, there are claims where they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, we have seen in recent um, requests for proposals specific references um, to, to or, or rather specific requests for um, these types of outcome-related fee arrangements. 
um, and, and, and awareness from the client that this is now something that's been permitted. Um, I, I think it, I, I should perhaps also um, just take the opportunity to um, circle back to um, the point that um, Gerald made earlier about um, how, how he was curious why it was, this is something that's particularly um, uh, preferred by Chinese clients. I think a lot of it is cultural. Um, I, I quite, I, I, I agree with um, a lot of the points that Gerald made. Um, if you do have a very strong case and you're confident of your case, why would you as a client uh, be willing to give up um, that, that share of the, um, of the um, damages that you, you expect to be recovering? Um, the, I, I think there is a difference in attitude between Chinese clients um, towards uh, out-of-pocket costs. And it, it, I, I have no good explanation for it besides the fact that it is cultural. Um, I have um, raised the point that you can put it in as a contingent um, uh, liability. Um, you, you, it, it, it does not seem to, um, it, it, it is just something that Chinese um, clients seem to be very particularly sensitive about, uh, no matter how confident they are of their case. Or of course, you know, they, there is a spectrum of, of uh, and diversity of views. Um, and I don't want to paint um, all clients with the same brush, but, but in general, the, the, uh, I do see a, a marked difference in attitudes towards legal spend between Chinese clients and, um, and, and the, clients from you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, other jurisdictions that I've practiced in. Um, from, so, so the other, the other uh, significant impact that I will see is that uh, you know, a lot of Chinese clients who potentially had um, claims that they decided not to pursue in the past due to aversion towards legal, legal fees, um, I mean, I, I've personally been on the receiving end of that where we've put in a, a pitch and, and the client literally um, just has not moved for a year because they were waiting for, for, for um, these arrangements to be allowed. Um, I, I think that will actually, that will actually pick up. Um, and also, so, uh, personally, I, I have a bit of an insolvency background and I... Um, find myself um, acting for insolvency practitioners pursuing claims on behalf of um, companies under liquidation. Um, and in the past, we would typically turn to third party funding for, um, for those types of, um, of cases, but outcome related fee structures um, uh, provide a different option. And I think um, these types of cases, um, and that's a very, very clear um, type of case that will um, benefit from um, from contingency uh, and and conditional uh, fees, these these types of cases will likely um, increase um, as well. Not not just because um, they've now been allowed, but uh, because um, of the financial downturn. Uh, just more of these types of cases in general. Um, so th those are my observations. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, Ruth. Would you have any input uh, from your perspective as a uh, litigation funder uh, on whether the um, recent reform in Singapore and Hong Kong, um, insofar as CFAs are concerned, have changed the landscape for uh, international arbitration and dispute resolution? As, as Sylvia said, you know, Hong Kong, it's only been four months. Singapore, uh, we're just about coming uh, to a year thereabouts. Uh, but in your experience over the past year or so, do you think the uh, reform has uh, changed the landscape from through from your lens? Sis? Yeah, I think certainly it has. Um, you know, the degree of that change still remains to be seen. But I know, as you know, as we're getting involved in in new opportunities and just speaking to, you know, legal professionals from both jurisdictions. These are types of fee arrangements that clients are now expecting to be presented with. Um, whether they eventually choose to use them or not is a different question. So to Gerald's point, you know, why, why would a company agree to them? Can 
terms be agreed that, that match both parties' expectations is a different question to just wanting to know what the options are. Um, and so from my perspective, I think the ability for these to come into the discussion at the outset of any case is a positive. You know, I think the more options any client has, the better it will be for them in making a decision as to whether to proceed or not. Um, in terms of just circling back to Gerald's point, uh, why companies might decide to go down this route, you know, maybe you're in a very, you know, unenviable position, Gerald, of only having very strong claims against counterparties who can pay for certain amounts. Um, you know, unfortunately for us, that's not the type of case we typically get asked to be involved with. But, you know, for various reasons, you might have very strong claim on the merits, but less certainty on quantum. Generally, in this part of the world, there'll always be enforcement risk. Um, and so for those reasons, it's very rare that you have a, a very, very certain overall perspective that you will recover and you will recover everything that you're awarded. Um, so for those reasons, I think, you know, there's always different degrees of uncertainty and people want to shift some of that risk to someone else. Um, so I think that's why ultimately it's just about trying to come out with an arrangement that meets everyone's commercial expectations. Um, one of the things that we haven't touched on too much, and you kind of mentioned it, Patrick, was um, in relation to the defence um, of cases. You know, I think people often overlook the fact that CFAs or these other types of fee arrangements and funding as well can be utilised in the defence context, you know, and it can also be, you know, from an access to justice perspective, people generally think about claimants who don't have the funds to pursue their claims. But equally, you have circumstances where a claimant, you know, a defendant or a respondent basically is forced to act. You know, they have very little choice um, or face the consequences. And they really might not have the funds um, to be able to defend themselves adequately. So from a levelling of the playing field type scenario, defence funding is also very important. Um, it requires a different discussion about what success is, where the recovery of the proceeds for either the law firm, if they're doing it on a CFA or for us as a funder comes from, you know, is different to the claimant scenario. But I do think it's equally important. Um, and it, it will, you know, the availability of, of these kinds of arrangements also is, is important from that perspective as well. Um, so I guess to round out the question, I think, you know, the, the changes in Hong Kong, I think, are likely to lead to greater change just because there are more options available. And I think by that nature, you know, different arrangements can be entered into and there's just more optionality for clients. But I still think, you know, the steps in both jurisdictions are very positive um, and, and, you know, further addition to the scope of where these kinds of arrangements can be used is, you know, would be a good thing from my perspective. Thanks, Ruth. Um, we've been talking about um, CFAs in the context of uh, international arbitration, international disputes. Um, but the CFA framework, at least in Singapore, uh, allows for CFAs to be utilized uh, not only for international arbitration and international disputes, but it extends to related proceedings as well. So it, it includes uh, mediations. So fairly broad in that sense. Uh, is this the same in, in, in Patrick as well, uh, in, in the UK, uh, Patrick? Yeah, that's right. It's so... Um... The, the rules apply to any sort of dispute resolution proceedings in the civil sphere with, with, with limited exceptions. Um, so um, we do see these um, just these arrangements being discussed where anything where there's a sort of uncertain outcome um, with, with parties taking opposing views. I mean, we usually see commercial claimants um, um, taking advantage of funding, but, you know, individuals, public bodies even, can look at this and and, and it's, it's very much the competition um law um rate world which is which is pushing a lot of the innovation here so um on the contingent side there are damages based agreements available in all civil civil litigation except in, in the employment um in, in employment sphere um, but those are are limited to to, to the claimant side of things um, and as, as Ruth mentioned um, on the defense side as well there's actually you know, a growing list of possibilities where people are looking at, at, at funding arrangement um, often in the context of a portfolio of claims where you've got claims going both ways or where you have counterclaims but but yeah even you know, my, my, my financial institution clients are a lot more interested than they would have been say five ten years ago about actually you know managing their very very big 
um, you know, litigation budgets and, 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 and looking at potentially um, uh, involving that, uh, involving other, other parties in that. So really sort of litigation as an asset class um, is, is, is evolving very, very quickly in the UK, I would say. There's a question in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, and I think that this relates to how uh, CFAs are actually uh, framed or put together. I think the question relates to um, an alignment of interests be between the parties, solicitor and client, through uh, entry into a CFA, uh, but then raises the po possibility that solicitors then drop out of the picture uh, in a scenario, for instance, where either the solicitor discharges himself or is discharged by the client, uh, what happens in that sort of a scenario? Um, Patrick, Sylvia, uh, would you want to take this one? Sure. I mean, there there are um, you know, the, the the definition of success, et cetera, is always 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 a big bone of contention, and you will have quite. Um, Quite a typically have quite a, uh, a comprehensive sort of termination regime in these CFAs, or all to be negotiated. Um, and so, yeah, the 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 the, 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 the retainer will, will certainly cover all these eventualities. And you know, it would be very naive to think that it will sort of you know, a, a case will run smoothly to either. Uh, court resolution or, or or settlement without any bumps along the way, and where you know, there's a there's a misalignment of interests, um, or, or or you know the the, the court uh, the, the 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 firm feels that you know it's it's it, it is no longer in a position to act. That that will be that will be contemplated in the agreement. Typically, I mean, as Sylvia, you may have more to add. Yeah, I mean that that was going to be my answer as well. I mean, there is a requirement. Um, in um, the applicable Hong Kong regime that you have um, certain terms set out in the arbitration agreement. Oh, sorry, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the um, outcome related fee structure agreements, um, be it a CFA, a DBA or a hybrid DBA. And um, one of them relates to how, uh, to basically what happens when um, you terminate that agreement. So um, that's all um, something to be discuss and negotiate between the parties and I, I would also say that um, I mean there there are there are safeguards um, uh, the, the, in, in particularly in Hong Kong where um, the the scope of applicability of um, these types of outcome related fee structures is still fairly limited to um, arbitration proceedings and uh, related court and mediation proceedings. What you will typically see is um, uh, clients who are more sophisticated in nature, and there will be some um, uh, there will be some negotiation um, that goes into each and every um, fee agreement that's entered into. It's not um, a, a scenario where you would just be um, uh, entering into an agreement with your um, um, with, with some, uh, you know, a, a typical um, uh, man of the street, um, and um, there be um, who, who has no clue uh, what um, they are signing, um, and um, yeah, so so that that's that's usually what happens. Um, and also on um, the, I, 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 I should mention that um, to Ruth's point earlier about people forgetting that um, it also applies to the defense side of things. Um, uh, there, that is actually also a very significant point. Um, you may um, think that you have a very strong case, but if you're faced with a vexatious um, claimant, um, you, you're only going to be um, facing either a loss of legal costs or um, in, in any event, even if you're successful. Um, so um, outcome related fee structures are, are quite helpful um, in aligning um, your interests that way. 
I, Can I, I just to add yeah, one, sure. one um, perspective on that? So not the jurisdictions that we've been talking about up until now, but um, in the US where these kinds of uh, fee structures have been used more extensively, I think, even than in the UK in the past, um, we actually do see a number of agreements where this kind of issue of how to deal with um, the CFA or, or contingency element on termination of the agreement is, is actually not really dealt with um, in the way that you would expect. Um, and in the, in the US, for example, the courts have had to step in and then there is case law around how that interest is treated. And I imagine it's still too early in, in Hong Kong and Singapore, for example, uh, you know, we're only just beginning to see these arrangements come through, let alone, you know, not work out as anticipated for various reasons, but I, I do think in due course, um, you know, hopefully the agreements will cover them sufficiently. But in any event, I, I think the courts will will be able to step in and then, you know, come to a re the the way the legislation in both places has been drafted. There's a, a you know a, a key um, hope that everything remains on a reasonable basis. So I think there will be a reasonable outcome that the courts would impose in that situation. So it's certainly, and just to leave it under English law, there would be mechanisms for the court to say that you know, as someone that the the, the, uh, the solicitor ought to be entitled to a fair remuneration for what it has done if the contract doesn't cover it. I mean, one way this may may be handled in the contract would be to give the the, the client broad termination rights, saying that it can terminate at will. However, if it does terminate, it will have to pay um, accrued costs to date. And if it continues with the claim, it will still be on the hook to pay whatever uplift was due to the firm. So the firm takes the benefit. But but uh, as we said, it's all it's all subject to negotiation, really. But um, um, yes, there's, I think most agreements that I've seen will cover this. So um, I think it's it's becoming fairly standard, certainly in this jurisdiction. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, there's a further question about the impact um, CFAs have on. Uh, settlement negotiations and disputes. Um, whether that's that's tricky, I mean, uh, you, you, have, you may well have a situation where a solicitor wants to avoid a, a no-win scenario or a lose uh, claim scenario, uh, and then finds himself in a position where he might be advising the client to accept a settlement to improve his chances of, uh, of recovering fees. I mean, and ultimately boils down as to boils down to how the uh, CFA is worded, uh, but yeah, I, I I thought this was uh, this is an interesting question, and perhaps Gerald, you is yeah, I I I don't think that that is a misalignment of interests. I think that if the solicitors think that they're going to lose the case, they really should be telling the client you're going to lose the case, and you're going to pay the other side's costs, and in the regimes where the loser pays. Um, and so a settlement is in everyone's interest. What you've, what, what all the discussion, the trend of the discussion has highlighted though, is that one of the, the difficult considerations is how do you define success? And you have to try and also cater for, for these possibilities. What, what does success mean in a settlement scenario? What does success mean in an arbitration? You don't want to settle for successes. You get an award. You want to actually enforce the award, um, so so that is an, is is one of the big considerations. But no, I don't think that 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 there is a, a, a I don't think it's bad that there's an incentive to reach a settlement where where a settlement is is appropriate. Now, Dara, on, on your point about uh, defining success, uh, it's often the case that the solicitor or the lawyer is the one that drafts the conditional fee agreement and therefore defines success uh, in the agreement. Um, if that is the case, um, I think one can assume that the definition of success or win is likely to favor the lawyer to begin with. Um, do, do you see any issues there? Because I'm holding the pen in drafting the agreement. I'll define win or success in a way which ultimately favors me as the lawyer. Um, yeah, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I guess you you've hit on an essential problem with contract with contracting, right? Somebody always holds the pen initially. Um, I don't know. Does this mean that you need uh, you need lawyers to advise you on on your negotiations with your lawyers? Maybe that's where uh, the funders come in, or maybe that's where having in-house counsel with experience comes in. 
just to add a perspective on that, you know, because obviously in funding we have similar, there can be similar issues. Um, this is where I think, although they're not favoured in Singapore, damages-based agreements can actually align interests better than conditional agreements um, because where you have everyone taking a proportionate amount of whatever's recovered, assuming that the lawyer's definition of success is also on recovery, not just on an award, for example, um, you know, the lawyers are going to have their eye on how much is ultimately available at the end of the day and how what percentage they will get of that rather than them taking a cut, a finite cut of whatever that amount is, regardless of what the amount is. Um, but to your point, Gerald, um, we do, it, it is a part of our funding agreement that says the client needs to get third party legal advice on the funding agreement. I appreciate funding agreements are probably more complex than, you know, your average CFA or DBA, but it's not a given. And it's the same as it, it, it's an agreement, you know, everyone has their own um, position, you know, they'll be looking out for their own, their own benefit. Um, so from a client's perspective, I think absolutely, you need to have someone um, thinking through the implications of these kinds of points. You can't say that the lawyers are looking out, they're not advising you on this, they're looking after their own interest in that context. And just yeah. to leap in there, it, 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 we frequently find ourselves brought in at that stage to advise you know, a, a client, even a funder, on on making sure that the, there is a, as a properly balanced funding arrangement. I think where the claim is purely monetary, it's fairly obvious what success means in terms of the recovery. But when you've got a bundle of relief, like declaratory relief and all those sorts of things, you need to think very, very carefully about what substantive success means and what when 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 payments are triggered so it's, it's a it's a very fair point um and on the settlement question yeah there is an alignment of interest but you know the the, the risks that the client and the law firm take are slightly different so it has to be a very grown-up conversation between the parties to work out where to settle the claim um, um uh, and 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 it, it's definitely a fair observation that there that's one of the um, tension points in the relationship yeah, and just to sort of um, add one one um, additional point, um, in, in define the, the the ability to define what success means is perhaps one of the advantages of a CFA um, over um, a DBA, um, in the sense that um, I I've um, I have a personal example where um, essentially the um, client. Um, wanted to have a um, CFA that applied to um, a specific um, issue um, that they that, that we determined would be dispositive of um, the, the entire arbitration uh, but could be heard as a pre preliminary issue and it was very easy in that si situation to um, for us to work out what's the likely legal cost of um, adjudicating this specific issue as preliminary issue, what, um, you know, uh, approximate percentage um, likelihood of success on that issue um, and the amount that would be, um, that would be saved uh, by not having to um, pursue the, the remainder of the proceedings and, and take that all into consideration and put forward um, a, a CFA that was acceptable to both the client and um, and ourselves, so um, that's that's one scenario where where that flexibility does work. Uh, thanks for sharing that, uh, Sylvia. I, I think it would be useful for us to perhaps also hear from Patrick um, from your experience, Patrick, in the UK. Any uh, notable examples of uh, successful outcomes resulting from CFAs uh, that you've you've handled and and can share? Lots in the arbitration world, which are necessarily confidential, but that's perhaps where we're seeing the most um, most active um, um, market um, in, in my world of, of financial disputes. Um, there has been a lot um, of, of reported case law around funding arrangements. Now, actually, a lot of that is not so much about the substance of the recovery. It's more about... Um, 
interim measures like security for costs and costs exposure of the funder and whether that should be you know the exposure of the funder ought to be capped at the amount that it's contributed to the funding or, or more broader than that lots of costs decisions so um i wouldn't say there's a single standout case that i would draw everyone's attention to but there is a a whole body of of of, of, of case law out there on on um, yeah the intricacies of funding arrangements and and the, and the ramifications of it all in, in the context of allocation of, of risk really in the conduct of proceedings and 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 so that the the, the 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 courts are regularly dealing with uh, the, the 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 knottier issues that are thrown up um, it, um, but as I said earlier it's all part of the um, the landscape of litigation now and so um, you know typically as as uh, these issues arise um they are catered for in, in the arrangements that parties put in place so um uh, i i don't I, I won't send anyone away with required reading from the uk side thanks patrick uh i'm just mindful of the of the time um the webinar is due to end at 5 30. i i thought it'd be useful to 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 end off with a sort of a general question uh, to to all the panelists uh, the question is this um how do how does each of you uh, see CFAs uh, evolving in the future? What sort of challenges, opportunities do you think um, lie in the future? But but really, the focus is uh, the, of the question is how, how do you think CFAs are going to evolve uh, as as time progresses? Um, Ruth, Sylvia, either of you. I'm happy to kick it off. Um, you know my. For Hong Kong and Singapore, where these are only very new, you know, there really can only be one trend, and that's expansion of use, um, you know, because they haven't been used and they will be used. Um, and it's a question of how much I think we take away looking at what's happened in other jurisdictions. And it's not going to be the case that these alternate arrangements are suitable for every case, but they will certainly be possible and clients will want to use them in many different circumstances. So I think it's something that will just become an option a bit a bit like third party funding has really you know I think I think it comes up as a discussion now in many engagement scenarios whether it's used or not just depends on the case at hand and so making it an option is an excellent move forward um, and hopefully you know in, in both jurisdictions it will become something that's available in in a broader scope of cases as well. Thanks Ruth. Uh, Gerald any concluding uh, thoughts or on that? Um, Two, two thoughts. I think it will be interesting to see whether the position in Singapore on damages-based agreements changes, because I agree with Ruth that in certain contexts, in certain, certain times, the there is more alignment if it's a damages-based agreement than just a conditional fee arrangement. Um, and if Hong Kong is doing it and Singapore is not, then there's a sort of uh, there's a there's an experiment there, a natural experiment there, I think they call it in economics. Um, the other thought I have is that it's an opportunity for law firms to compete on this. I don't know if you if you're the law firm that can figure out how to deal with the lumpiness uh, of, of, of your your revenues um, and and work out the economics, there there is uh, an ability to win some clients who are going to balk at the upfront costs, uh, particularly in arbitration. Um, so there, there's opportunities and it will be interesting to see if some law firms get more business than others because of that, although it'd be hard to, to get the data on that. Patrick, any uh, anything you would like to add? Uh, I agree with all of that. I think in the UK, where I'm really watching the developments closely is in the collective proceedings world with, uh, I think, um, funding and law firm risk participation is, 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 is particularly suited to um, some of the sort of uh, collective claims out there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with um, seeing an expansion in the range of class actions it's nothing like the us or or, or or other markets but i think it's going in that direction um representative actions are still quite difficult in the uk but i think there's a lot of um a lot of interest in in there so i think that's where we'll see a lot of the innovation but i think um it's 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 here to stay and it's an accepted and beneficial part of the market and i think you'll probably see a similar similar um trajectory in other jurisdictions 
I guess that leaves me. Yes. Um, I, I think um, uh, I agree with everything that's been said before. Um, the possibly one um, challenge to touch upon is, is navigating um, how the various interlocutor, uh, interlock, interlocking um, regulatory regimes um, would, would play out. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm actually right in the middle of, um, uh, of, of putting together something um, in relation to a Hong Kong seated arbitration for a Chinese client, um, US counterparty, and um, the, the, the counterparty may is on the brink of potentially um, having bankruptcy proceedings um, brought against them in the US. Um, how, how do we structure it in a way that satisfies the um, regulations in, in all of the various jurisdictions that, um, that, we, uh, that the various lawyers are acting in um, that also satisfactory to the, um, to the client? Um, and um, how do we deal with the question of um, uh, of the cost consequences um, involved, um, that, that's going to be particularly tricky. But um, I think one way that that um, challenge um, could also be um, uh, resolved is, is if more and more jurisdictions um, expand <laughs> um, the, the scope uh, of, um, of arrangements that can be enter into so that there is greater compatibility um, and um, in that regard really um, watching um, to see if Hong Kong um, expands um, the uh, availability of outcome related fee structures to um, commercial litigation more generally. Uh, thanks Sylvia. Just, uh, just a few final points from me uh, here sitting here in Singapore. I think my own sense is that the implementation of the uh, CFA regime uh, and any expansion as to its scope is, is likely to be incremental. Uh, it's going to be dependent on the take up of the CFAs to begin with. Uh, and also I think critically the uh, viability of any uh, uh, accompanying safeguards uh, to protect clients from potential abuse. I think all of this is going to play a big role. Um, um, and but but watch this space. I think we're going to we're going to start seeing more and more CFAs being entered into. I mean that's my sense moving forward. Uh, I think this has been a very very uh, healthy fruitful discussion. We've spent an hour and a half uh, on the topic. Um, I think it's been it's proved to be very very beneficial. And I think it leaves me now to hand the time back to to Victor uh, to deliver his uh, closing remarks. Victor. Ramesh, thank you very much. And I, I would agree with you. It's been a very interesting um, a, a very interesting conversation, um, particularly for me as a, as a complete layman. And I know there are lots of lawyers in the audience, and I'm sure they've benefited significantly too from the panel's insights and uh, references to what actually happens in each jurisdiction. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Gerald, Patrick, Ramesh, Ruth, and Sylvia, thank you all for taking the time to be with us. Um, again, a word of thanks to our wonderful Legal Services Interest Group, uh, whose initiative this webinar uh, was. So my thanks to them uh, for being so active and for striving to bring to their community and to their fellow members in the chamber topics of relevance and of interest. So on behalf of everybody at the chamber, um, I want to thank everybody for their time today. You can always contact us at here to help at sicc.com.sg if you've got any questions or suggestions for topics for future events or webinars. And those of you who are not members who would like to know more about membership, you can drop us a line at membership at sicc.com.sg. But for now, from me and my team, thank you very much. Good afternoon and wish everybody a pleasant evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>